Um, we're pleased to introduce um, Kevin Sharp, Dr. Kevin Sharp. He's the director of RK. Um, he's done some work on reasons, where he recently published a book, um, Conceptual Engineering and Truth. Um, and now he's here to talk about something he's been working on lately, which is artificial intelligence and especially its relation to philosophy. So thanks so much to Kevin for agreeing to do this talk, and I hope you all enjoy. Great, thanks. So today we're talking about kind of uh, cutting edge stuff that I'm thinking about right now. And uh, this is also sort of an advertisement to help get, or the, the idea would be to get you guys excited about this, the younger generation of people who uh, have an opportunity to, uh, in the future, influence the discipline of philosophy, hopefully for the better. And one of the, the ways I think that could be done would be by utilizing some of the tools that we now have from artificial intelligence in the process of doing philosophy. So using artificial intelligence, and in particular machine learning, as tools for, for improving your, uh, your philosophical outputs, or improving uh, the, the, the discipline of philosophy. Um, so that's the goal today. And one of the things that I want to contrast this with is a sort of standard way of thinking about the relationship between artificial intelligence and philosophy, where the philosophers uh, play the role of uh, something like referees or somewhere along those lines where we say, no, 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 you guys shouldn't be doing this. Instead, you should be doing this. Don't be making uh, uh, artificially intelligent uh, weapons systems because that might run amok. Duh. Or and, and instead, you know, be making artificially intelligent cars, and then here's a decent algorithm, you know, thing, middle or consequentialism, for how to run a, uh, a self-driving car. So basically the ethics of AI and the ethics of machine learning, that's the standard way of thinking about the relationship between philosophy and artificial intelligence. And that's something I don't want to talk about tonight at all. Instead, I'm talking about the opposite, which is what artificial intelligence can do for philosophy as opposed to what philosophy can do for artificial intelligence. Okay, so uh, you have a handout, maybe, the, I didn't print out enough probably, but if you don't have one, then you can look at the, actually there's a bunch up here if, you're, um, if people still don't have them. Uh, but you can also look up here, I don't know if it's okay. Okay, so uh, just to get some terminology down, I take artificial intelligence to be the project of designing a artificial agent that is intelligent in the same way that a human is intelligent. So an artificial intelligence is the project of designing an agent that is intelligent in the same way that a human is, you know, able to make uh, complex strategic decisions in a, uh, a world where you don't know all of the features, you don't know what's going to happen when you do various things, and also included in that world are other rational entities that you can interact with strategically. So I can interact with non-rational entities like the table in certain ways, but when I interact with, with a, a rational entity like another human being, I interact in a very different way. I assume that you're rational and you're trying to figure out what I'm going to do and I'm trying to figure out what you're going to do when you try to figure out what I'm going to do and so on and so on. That's AI. Now, within AI, that's a very large circle, and within artificial intelligence, there is the project of machine learning, or the topic of machine learning. And it's not the entirety of AI, but it is a large part of it. And when you see today in headlines, pretty much every freaking day, there's a new headline about how AI is doing something amazing, most of those headlines are based on algorithms that fit into the machine learning category. Now, machine learning is entirely uh, about algorithms. And an algorithm is a step-by-step -step procedure that doesn't require any kind of insight or anything like that. It's easy to follow step-by-step -step procedure that's automatic. And the idea of an algorithm should be uh, you know, fairly straightforward. Uh, think about a recipe for uh, cooking something and uh, and if you kind of persist by the, the procedure there, then you get something like an algorithm. Okay. 
there are a number of different ways of, um, of breaking up machine learning into different categories, and these have changed over the years. It used to be that people only talked about supervised and unsupervised machine learning. Those were the two big categories. And then over the last three or four years, reinforcement learning has taken on a much bigger role to the point where it seems like a completely separate category on its own and that most of the textbooks and uh, survey articles that you'll see published in the last year or two reflect this usage where reinforcement learning is a separate kind of machine learning. Now, it's also not very popular to bring evolutionary uh, algorithms into this sort of mix. Very, very few surveys actually cover these sorts of algorithms. An, an, ev an evolutionary algorithm would be one where um, you, you, you run it on the task and then uh, you, uh, you, you generate a whole bunch of different versions of that algorithm and then see which one does the best on the task and then you generate a bunch of new versions of that best one and you keep going through different generations and you get better and better and better. Now, how do you generate the new ones? Those, the, you know, the, the procedures differ there. But the reason I'm including evolutionary algorithms as a separate kind of machine learning is entirely based on the kind of feedback that you get. So this categorization scheme, this four-part categorization scheme, is based entirely on the kind of feedback that the algorithm utilizes. That's the key. So supervised machine learning algorithms require labeled data. So for example, I give a, a, a supervised machine learning algorithm a bunch of images, and I have each limited image labeled as to whether there's a cat in it or not. And the, the algorithm is then supposed to figure out whether there's a cat in the image. And so I showed an image and it says, no cat. And I say, no, you're wrong. There was a cat in that one. And it says, oh, OK. And it changes a little bit based on that feedback. So now think about what kind of feedback that is. That's the feedback where you, you're the algorithm, you give an answer, and I tell you the right answer. Okay? That's supervised feedback. I tell you the right answer. Now, if you gave me the right answer, then you know you got the right answer. right? If you gave me the wrong answer, then you don't know how wrong you are. All you know is what the right answer is. Okay. Unsupervised is where you don't have any labels. Instead, what you're looking for is patterns amongst unlabeled data. So imagine a bunch of images that might or might not have cats in them. You don't tell the, the, the algorithm whether it has a cat or not. Instead, it just looks at the data and figures out which images are, say, similar to one another in various dimensions. There's lots of different ways of doing this, but one popular way of doing unsupervised learning would split the group into categories. You could ask it for multiple different numbers of categories, or you could ask it to generate the most natural or uh, perspicuous categories, or what have you. Reinforcement learning uses a totally different idea. Here you have something like an artificial agent that is in an environment, and that thing is supposed to, uh, to, 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 to try to achieve some rewards. And the rewards are built into the environment. So for example, if I have an algorithm that's learning how to play a video game, say Tetris, and, um, and it drops the blocks straight down on top of one another and then loses right off the bat, then it's not going to get very much reward, but if it runs up the score, it gets more reward, and it learns to change its strategies based on the rewards that it receives in different circumstances. And it, all of these algorithms, all the machine learning algorithms that I'm talking about in here, alter themselves as they encounter data. So the standard way about thinking about programming is the human is the programmer, and you tell the program what to do, and then sometimes it does it, most of the time it doesn't. And then that's it, right? So you tell the program what to do. For machine learning algorithms, these are programs that change themselves as they encounter data. And they change themselves in ways that their programmers couldn't have anticipated. Okay. So in a reinforcement learner, 
it has the project or the, the task of maximizing its rewards. And you tell it what the rewards are, and it figures out how to maximize them. So reinforcement learning algorithms have achieved unbelievable successes in some narrow areas. For example, chess, Go, the, the recent massive success of AlphaGo and AlphaGo Zero, which beat the, um, the best, or arguably the best, uh, human Go player and uh, changed the game in various ways. Those are reinforcement learners. Uh, just, what was it, last week, I think, uh, a reinforcement learning algorithm by DeepMind, which is uh, located in London, uh, just achieved, was it, um, uh, some sort, of, uh, I think it was master status in StarCraft, the, the, uh, the, the strategy game. And uh, that's a status that very few actual humans have achieved. And, um, so it, it's actually been able to, to, to do something in a, a strategic game, kind of the epitome of a strategic game, that most humans wouldn't be able to do. Finally, the evolutionary ones I described a minute ago, they're the ones that use a fitness function, so you decide. Here's, a fun, here's an algorithm, here's a task, how fit, how good is it at doing this, and then you increase the fitness through generation after generation. And since they're algorithms, and you have some time, and you have pretty powerful computers these days, you can run through 1,000 or 10,000 or 50,000 generations pretty quickly, and you can achieve some really remarkable results. If you look at a, a, a there's videos on YouTube right now where you can see ones that, uh, evolutionary ones that uh, teach something to walk in, a, in an environment. You see the early ones, you know, they're horrible, they fall over all the time, they can't go steps, you know, they do all these clumsy stuff. And you look at a little, you know, further down the line, it's more smoother, it's a little bit more, uh, more elegant, and then further down the line, it can actually go upstairs, further down the line, it might be able to jump over obstacles, and so So, I'm distinguishing between philosophy of AI which is, what are the philosophically interesting things about AI? Which is very similar to philosophy of biology. What are the philosophically interesting things about bio? Or philosophy of physics. What are the philosophically interesting things about physics? Or philosophy of action, or philosophy of anything. So philosophy of X has a certain sort of schema to it. We understand how that schema works, right? You look at the philosophically interesting aspects of X, and here you're just doing that for AI. That's the standard way to think about the relationship between artificial intelligence and philosophy. But in here today, I'm encouraging you to think differently about this relationship. Instead of exploring the sort of played out, to some extent, philosophy of AI topics, like, given all these algorithms, I can do this intelligent stuff, what do we mean by intelligence anymore? Humans used to assume that intelligent behavior was a package deal. You can do all kinds, you all, everybody in this room, all of you have an amazing set of capabilities. You can understand language, you can produce language, you can reason in various ways, you can infer things deductively, inductively. We used to think that all those capacities came as a package deal. You either have all of them or you have none of them. You have all of them. This thing has none of them. That's it, that's how the world works. Those two categories, that's it. But now we realize that there's a whole bunch of different in-between states. There are algorithms that can display some intelligent behaviors, but not others. So what is the nature of intelligence anymore? That's one of the big topics. Another one is the ethics of AI, which I mentioned a bit ago. How should we program cars that drive themselves. When they decide whether to hit one person or hit three people, should they take into consideration the ages of those people? Like, yeah, one person's like eight, and there's like a kid in the group of three, so I'm gonna go with eight. Is that right? Or should we not program them that way? These are complicated questions in the ethics of AI. So again, that's all interesting stuff, but
but it's also the stuff that most people who think about the relationship between artificial intelligence and philosophy focus on. And in here, I'm trying to get you to think about something different, which is how to use AI to do philosophy. That's what I'm gonna talk about. Okay. So I have three topics here that I wanna give you some examples of. And then I'm gonna to try to quit early so there's, enough, so there's more time than usual for the discussion. <laughs> First one is, what are the topics in philosophy? Now this is one of the things that you learn as an undergraduate, right? Okay, there's metaphysics, there's epistemology, there's philosophy of mind, there's philosophy of language, there's logic, there's ethics, there's social and political, there's philosophy of law, there's aesthetics. Maybe there's a scattering of other topics in there as well. Okay. Some people make their own topics. No. <laughs> I see plenty of CVs where you know, the, the subject matter of the person studies is not an accepted subject matter. <laughs> <laughs> so now, one question is, where do these come from? Where do you get these topics? How do you know what the topics in philosophy are? Other than, you know, your professor told you that. Well, it turns out that we have a pretty good repository for philosophical texts right now, and it's called Phil Papers. If you don't know about Phil Papers, then go home tonight and check out Bill Papers, because it's amazing. It's a beautiful repository, and built into the, to this repository is a topics of philosophy, and you can organize the papers based on topic, and subtopic, and sub-subtopic. Where'd those come from? Right? Who came up with those? David Chalmers came up with them. Where? Sitting in his chair, thinking about it, right? They go, what are the topics of philosophy? If I'm in a philosophy mind, what do I think? Now, Chalmers is a good person to do this. He's ridiculously well-read. He's unbelievably intelligent. He's one of the most important philosophers around right now. He's been doing great stuff since he put out his dissertation in 1996. He's a good person to pick this stuff, you know? If you want to pick a person to sit in a chair and figure out what the topics of philosophy are, but you're just thinking about it, he's a good option. But there's a better option. Use a machine learning algorithm. Take an unsupervised machine learning algorithm. I'm still up here on Phil topics. Take an unsupervised machine learning algorithm and set it loose on the Phil Papers archive. All it needs to do is read the abstracts and titles, and it thinks about which words are related to one another to which degree, and it can generate, here are the topics, right? Here are the philosophical topics. Different of these algorithms will do this differently. In general, these are called clustering algorithms. If you're interested in trying this out, you can, right? Pretty straightforwardly. Go to Google. Do the crash course in machine learning. It takes a few hours. <laughs> go to, go to uh, Phil Papers, download their data, it's easy, and run an unsupervised machine learning algorithm on it and tells you what the topics are. You could do this in a week on your own with very little, uh, with very little training. We have no idea what the real philosophical topics are. We have what Dave Chalmers think the philosophical topics are, but we don't have anything closer to objective about what the, what the topics are. If it turns out epistemology isn't a topic, that would be interesting. So this is one area where you can use artificial intelligence, cutting artificial intelligence cutting edge cutting machine learning algorithms to do philosophy, philosophical talk. You could write a grant for, you know, 10 grand, send it to the, uh, you know, one of the big funding agencies right now and get funded to do this pretty much tomorrow. So the next topic, the next area where artificial intelligence can play a role in philosophy is in counterexamples and examples. So we have a tremendous number of philosophical theses out there that philosophers, we spend our time arguing back and forth on. Some topics, Gricean semantics, that's one, one philosophical thesis. Normative externalism, that's another one. 
Moral particularism, that's another one. We have other views on what are concepts like, and how did altruism arise in groups of entities that are, for the most part, self-interested. Think about how much altruism there is in the world today. You see somebody drop their stuff. Somebody else helps them pick it up. That happens all the time. You don't even think about it. You don't, even, you don't see that. And you're like, oh my god, look at that ape helping this other ape. They're so interested. Why are you helping this other ape? Right? But it's a big problem. How can self-interested entities end up cooperating? So now, this is the area that I think has a lot of growth potential, probably the most of either, any of these three. Using machine learning as a testing ground for philosophical theses, as a place where one can generate examples of controversial philosophical theses, or counterexamples of familiar and accepted philosophical theses. So the first two are examples. So what, what question is, what are concepts? Oh my god, this, this question has just been a nightmare in philosophy. There's a million different things that people think concepts are, and there's a huge debate about this. Of course, nobody means the same thing by what concepts are, and there's big debates about whether they exist at all. Some people think we should stop using the word concept altogether. Other people think that's wrong. One question is, what kinds of representational concepts do you, for lack of a better term, do machine learning algorithms deploy? How do they represent the world? You've got the concept of a dog. Does a machine learning algorithm have the concept of a dog? How could you tell? How would you even be able to identify? I mean, they behave intelligently. It seems like they're utilizing concepts. When you look at papers published by machine learning theorists on machine learning algorithms, they describe them as using concepts. Look at the concept that this neural network uses. This neural network doesn't have that. Why not? Didn't get trained. Not enough steps. So, what are the nature of concepts, and how is it that a mathematical algorithm can share something with you? How can you both have the concept of a dog? You're made out of meat. The other thing is just a mathematical algorithm. It's just a, a, a program, a function. Though. How can a function share something with meat? Altruism, I mentioned a moment ago, there's been uh, probably two dozen papers published in the last year or two where you take a bunch of machine learning algorithms and you stick them in an environment and you make them selfish and you show that they can display cooperative behavior. Brian Skarns has a book called The Stag Hunt. A long time ago, seven. And in there, he talks about a theory on the origin of algorithms. Today, we can test that theory by using artificially intelligent algorithms and seeing how they're programmed to be selfish, but they learn to cooperate. There's a lot of papers on this right now. So this is, this is already something as an example in the literature for a philosophical thesis Selfish, rational entities can learn to display cooperative behavior. It's already been established and demonstrated in the machine learning environment. Okay, so counterexamples. Grice's semantics. Grice was a big philosopher of language in the middle of the 20th century. Much of what we think of today as philosophy of language is dedicated or is you know, dependent on his insights. And one of his big insights is this idea that semantic properties depend on audience audience directed intentions. So one of the things, one of the words I've used in here is dog. Now, when I say, there's a dog. According to Grice, I have an intention. I intend that you guys recognize my intention to get you to think about some particular object in the world, dogs. And when you're thinking about humans, this seems pretty reasonable. It does seem like you have intentions. It does seem like when you have a linguistic exchange with somebody, you have certain intentions about what they want to do and what you want them to, 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 to understand or grasp out of it. But when you're dealing with an algorithm, for the most part, they don't have intentions. 
You go to the ATM, right? The ATM has a bunch of language on there. It's not like you just guess that it wants you to type in your code. It tells you to type in your code. And you type in and it says, we're doing it. How do you know what that means? That thing doesn't have any intentions. How can you interact with natural language processing algorithms when they don't intend anything? Seems like a Gricean picture, which has been a standard in philosophy of language for 50 or 60 years, has got to be wrong. We have lots of good examples of algorithms that have linguistic <laughs> capacity but don't have anything like intentions. Another one, normative externalism. Man, this is a big, a big topic. And it's a hot topic, and it's going to get hotter over the next five to ten years. I, I don't know if I can even tell you a topic that I thought was going to be hotter than this one. The idea is that our access to right and wrong, good and bad, how one ought or ought not behave, is not a priori. You do not have a priori access, that is, experience independent access to what you should do. Instead, you figure out what's right and wrong in mostly the same way that you figure out how the, the world is otherwise, by exploring it. Right and wrong, moral principles in general, or normativity in general, turns out to be contingent and a posteriori, depending on empirical evidence. So that means you might be unsure of the right and moral principles. You might not have access to the right and moral principles. For example, Aristotle, who was an important philosopher from around 2,400 years ago, he advocated slavery. Why? Is it okay to go and say, no, no, that man? People just, well, you know, how's the rest of the story go? Is it that he had access to the right thing to do, but he just ignored it? Or did he not know the right moral principles? According to the normative externalist, it's the latter. You're in the same boat. Don't think you know what's going on just because you're an act. When we look at reinforcement learning algorithms, we see they behave in a normatively externalist way. They don't have built-in functions that tell them what they should want. They figure out what they should want by exploring the world and figuring out what they should value. Not something that you just have access to built-in. So if you think about your desires, you think about what you know about your desires. Right? And I say, do you desire you know, cake? And you, let's say you say no. And I say, I think you're wrong. I don't think you know what you desire right now. You'd be like, what are you talking about? I'm me. I know what I desire. I have access to my desires. I have authority over my desires. If I tell you what I desire, then I'm right and you're wrong. So that's not how these guys work. That's not how these machine learning algorithms work. They don't have something built in like a desire or something that you can just access automatically. Okay, last one. Moral particularism. This has been a big deal in metaethics for a long time now, at least 20 years. Here's the idea. Let's imagine you're a good person. Go out and hold <laughs> Now, are you a good person because you know what the good moral principles are? Do you have to know what the right moral truths, unrestricted, un un uh, uncontextualized, general moral truths are? Like, don't kill people, don't lie. Is that the only way to be a good person? Is by following moral principles? Or can good people simply be making decisions individually, not in general, just in particular situations, and still do the good stuff? That's the question. We have very good evidence from reinforcement learning algorithms that you don't need moral principles in order for them to behave properly that is in accordance with moral norms. 
reinforcement learning algorithms are moral particularists. You can look at the algorithm and tell. No general principles in it. There's no general principles in it. And you can still get them to behave normally. That seems like support for that. So really, this is the biggest element of the talk. This is the biggest aspect of the talk that I want to impress upon you. If you come away with nothing else, come away with this, that there's a lot to be done on the ground First order philosophy using machine learning. All of these examples are examples of using machine learning to either promote or thwart first order philosophical theses, ones that you're all familiar with. All right, last one's a bit more second. So here's the last one. So far, only humans have published philosophy. So far. Hopefully, you will all live to the time when algorithms publish philosophy as well. It won't be that far. And I want to think for a moment how this went. IBM has a project that you can go look at right now. It's called Project Debater. I highly recommend going and looking at their website. They have a team of machine learning algorithms that, as a team, will debate a human or a team of humans about some topic. So, for example, you tell the thing, uh, you are going to argue in favor of euthanasia. And the algorithms go on the web. They read hundreds of thousands of pages, just like that. And they compile novel arguments for the conclusion that you told it to argue for. And when the debater, when the algorithms, remember it's just, it's just algorithms, no humans are helping it. When this thing debates high school, secondary school students in debate teams, it'll win. It will not win against university teams yet. Although it's getting better and better, right? I mean, it's only been around for a couple of years, right? How much longer is it really going to be before it beats you guys, before it beats us, before it beats anybody? Not that long. Either way, the main point here is that we already have machine learning algorithms that will generate novel arguments for theses that you give them. Not going to generate novel theses, but it will generate novel arguments for theses that you give them. Now, when I try to figure out whether I want to publish a paper, a lot of the time, if I've come up with a new argument for a familiar thesis, that's publishable. <coughs> right? I come up with a new argument for a novel or for an, for an existing familiar thesis. That could be a publishable paper if it's an interesting argument. If it's different enough from the way people already argue for it. If it's got benefits over existing arguments, that could already be a publishable paper. But really what I want to get is a novel thesis and a novel argument. That's what most of the that cool philosophical uh, papers that get published have. Tons of philosophical papers that get published that don't go anywhere, but the ones that are really interesting are the ones that are like that. So, how do we do that? Here's an idea. That's totally fine. There's the, there's your title. Just published a couple of months ago. Here's the abstract. Here's the idea. You can read through the, de the details if you want, but here's the basics of it. In material science and materials physics, you can train an algorithm to run through abstracts and think about which words occur together. And just based on that, just looking at the words that humans have put together to predict discoveries that no one's ever thought about. That's pretty amazing. If we run the same sort of unsupervised algorithm on philosophical databases, then we can get novel philosophical theses that no one's ever defended or entertained before. It'll spit those out. So together, under the final category, artificial philosophy, 
artificial philosophers. Right. What I would imagine is something like this. One algorithm that generates a novel philosophical thesis, and then something like the IBM debater that generates a novel argument for that thesis. And then you can have a paper published in a top philosophy journal with an algorithm as first author. So ultimately, I'm giving you a number of ways in which artificial intelligence can be put to use in the service of philosophy. And these are not uses that require years of training to utilize. These are moves that are available to you with very little training from where you're at right now. So for those of you who do go into philosophy as a career, or even just as an interesting pastime or hobby. You're in a position to be able to push the conversation forward by using the latest technology that we have as a species right now. So using what we have right now, just discovered in the last decade as a species, we can push forward a discipline that's been around for 2,600 years and still been thinking about a lot of the same questions for 2,600 years. That's really interesting. And that's what I'm trying to get you to appreciate overall as a sort of advertisement trying to get you involved. All right, so thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, so I was just wondering, you know, you've outlined this kind of approach to doing philosophy. Yeah. And where, if at all, do you see the limits of this approach being, you know, in theoretical computer science, we've got lots of limitative results, yeah. undecidable decision problems. Yep. Will we ever butt up against those as we're doing this? Yeah, I think we will. So there's a really neat problem that is associated with girls and completeness theorems. So, one of the foundations of contemporary mathematical logic and computer science and pretty much any sort of formal discipline is the, the results that Kurt Gödel proved in the early 1930s. And these results, you can describe them in lots of different ways, but one way of describing them is something like this. If I have a system that's supposed to generate all the truths about some topic, then there's no way for me to do that if my system is even moderately or even sort of complex. So if my system is powerful at all, then it's going to be incomplete. Yep. It's not going to be able to generate all the truths. Okay, so now, Kurt Gödel himself thought that this result and the result that follows a second incompleteness theorem has to do with whether you can prove that your own system is consistent. You can't. Um, he, he himself thought that these had big implications for the nature of intelligence. And the... So, so I think the, the, the easy answer to your question is yes. We'll definitely be running up against interpretations of these limited results. Now, whether we run up against these limited results is going to depend on which of those interpretations are the right one. And there's also there's a decent bit of argument about how to interpret them. If you want a nice collection on this, just came out based on a, on a, 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 a conference that occurred uh, maybe three or four years ago um, here in the UK. Uh, the book is called Girls Disjunction. And uh, it is a collection that lays out multiple different ways of dealing with the limited, uh, the interpretation of these limited results that Gödel came up with, you know, almost 100 years ago. And the fact that we're still trying to figure out, you know, we're still trying to figure out how to understand them and whether they really pose genuine limitations on human knowledge. Yeah, um, so I'm not a philosophy. Can an AI do that? And if it can't, does that show problems with appealing to intuition right now? Yeah, so I think that, um, so a couple of things. One, there's a big debate, as I'm sure you know, about intuitions and the nature of intuitions and whether they really play a role in philosophy. Some people think, yeah, 
it's all about intuitions. And other people are like, no, it's, none of it's about intuitions, right? Of course, lost me like that. Now, um, one way of thinking about the bare results that you get from a supervised uh, uh, algorithm like a neural network is intuitive. These are intuitive judgments that the, the neural network spits out. And there's an analogy with a way of thinking about human cognition that's been pretty popular, I guess, over the last 40 or 50 years now. And this is the idea that you have two processes of cognition, dual process views of cognition, where you have something that runs at an intuitive level, that's automatic and fast and uncontrolled, and another system that runs in step-by-step -step fashion that requires a lot of energy and exertion and is controlled. This idea is a system one, <coughs> system two. Uh, th this big idea usually is, um, is called the heuristics and biases tradition. And it's moved away from uh, uh, just psychology to affect lots of other areas, including economics and finance and philosophy and linguistics even, and lots of other areas. So you might think of system one as something like a neural network anyway. And you know, producing intuitive judgments is kind of the you know, one hallmark for system one. And so you might think of you know, the, the judgments that a neural network puts out as, uh, as something like intuition. So what you can, what, one thing you could imagine is a sort of intuitive uh, algorithm that spits out intuitions, and you could have another sort of you know, reasoning algorithm that checks them and thinks about them, whether they should be advocated or not. And that would work a lot like the way a lot of psychologists and economists and neuroscientists think your brain works. So yeah, I do think there's a place for thinking about the concept of intuitions in a machine learning framework. You want me to call them? Oh, you, you could do it. Yeah. yeah. Building off your response there, can you talk a little bit about how we had overcome some of the uh, black box issues that yeah. you get into where you know, yeah. we have these results, but we're not able to determine how we yeah, okay. uh, AI actually arrived at those results. This is one of my favorite topics. Okay, okay so um, here's the big problem. I give you an algorithm, and the algorithm, you know, say works for a, a hospital, and it says whether we should treat you or not. Right? We only have limited you know, resources, right? We can't treat everybody. So now you come in, I, ask, I say, oh, okay, you're sick, you need something wrong with you, I check the algorithm, the algorithm says, yeah, thank you. <laughs> now you're going to be like, what the hell, right? I mean, how do you get this result from an algorithm? Like, what is it? What's its reason, you know? I, I, I need a reason here. If I'm gonna be denied healthcare by a, by a computer program, I wanna know why. And you say, well, you know, it's got some parameters. <laughs> you know, when we set those parameters, it spits out, no, what do you want, what is your answer? <laughs> <laughs> Not very satisfying. So instead, what you want is a sort of humanly understandable answer, right? And the one big move in machine learning, I'm, I know you know this, but I'm telling you everybody else, one big move in machine learning is explainable or interpretable artificial intelligence. So usually the term explainable goes with AI, so you get XAI, and the term interpretable goes with machine learning, so interpretable machine learning. Interpretable machine learning just means an algorithm that you understand why it gave you the answer, and you understand it in human terms, not just, well, that's what the parameters were set for or whatever. So I've been working a lot on reasons, recently, and thinking about the nature of reasons, and the space of reasons, and how many different kinds of reasons are there, and I've, as a result, also been thinking a lot about the kinds of reasons that an algorithm could give for its behavior, right? And so, what I think is, I think what you'll see is, in, 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 you know, in, in coming years, there's an already been a big in, in, emphasis on algorithms that can do this, that can give you reasons for their behavior. And I think you'll see more and more and more of this as they start to take over more and more critical decision-making tasks. So the more critical decision-making tasks you see algorithms doing, the more emphasis there will be on humanly comprehensible reasons for their behavior, which is the, the thing that you're asking about. So I see that as something that's definitely gonna happen and something that there's a lot of money being put into it. A lot of research, a lot of publications, this is a big hot topic right now. But the interesting thing is, how does this relate to philosophy? And one way I think it relates to philosophy is, what kinds of reasons 
might an algorithm be able to give that differ from the reasons that humans toss around to each other, right? So, you know, you tell me you want, um, you know, tell, you tell me you're cold or you want me to turn up the heat, you know, I can ask you why, give me a reason. Yeah, you, you know, if you tell me that you think that the Earth is only 6,000 years old, I can ask you why, you can give me a reason. Are those, the, are those kinds of reasons the same kinds of reasons that we might expect an algorithm to give? Or can algorithms give reasons of a fundamentally different kind than the ones that humans appreciate and toss around frequently? That's, I think, a really interesting question. And I think that the answer to that question is going to be yes. They give different kinds of reasons. There are going to be something like reasons that are specifically algorithmic. And uh, the, the, the reason I have for saying that is that I think one of the things that you'll find is when we start thinking about how algorithms represent the world, yes, you'll be able to find some algorithms that have a node that basically is the concept of a dog. Yes, you'll be able to find them have a node that's basically the concept of a car. But a lot of those things are going to be bizarro concepts that you and I have never even contemplated before. And so you ask the algorithm, you know, why'd you tell me that this thing is a bird? And it's going to say, well, because it's, a, it's an X and not a Y, and it's also a Z. I'm like, okay, great, what's an X? Oh, well, I can't really explain that. That's a concept you just don't know. I have it. <laughs> so how far can you push this XAI thing if algorithms have representational capacities that we can't understand, I think is an important question. And that's why I see this as a growth there. think there is a limit to which we can draw these analogies, and so a limit to which these analogies can be valuable or used as basis for conclusions? Yeah, I think that the closer the algorithms get to what you think of and I think of as the whole range of human intelligent capacities, the stronger these results will be. Because right now, somebody could be like, uh, I didn't write this out of it, but moral particularism is just Incoherent, right? Can't have it. Good entities always follow principles. Philosophers argue that right now in the literature, right? And so then I say, imagine I come on the scene and I say, well, here's this machine learning algorithm. It displays intelligence and it behaves in a moral particularist way. It has no general moral principles of any kind and I can show you that it doesn't have any, right? Then your response, of course, is that's not real intelligence, right? Now, the closer that thing is to behaving the way you and I behave, the stronger point I have. So that's why I think that as these things acquire more and more sophisticated abilities, these kinds, I'm pointing to nothing, these kinds of you know, example, counterexample, philosophical moves are going to become much more compelling. That's what you're asking, right? Yeah, there's also, um, because Surely there is a sense in which um, the intelligence could be sophisticated and could produce many of the same, um, same actions and decisions and capabilities as us, but in a different way. Yeah. And so if we're not asking what capabilities do humans have, but how do they have those capabilities, yeah, yeah. Can, can we know that we have those capabilities for the same reasons as the artificial intelligence? Good. So what's nice about this, uh, this application is, for the most part, when philosophers make claims, they're making claims that are taken to be necessary or conceptual, right? So when I say no agents are moral particularists, I mean, it's inconceivable, you know? It's, it's necessary that moral agents don't behave this way. So if you say, well, I have it does. And you say, well, it doesn't behave, it doesn't internally act the way you do, it doesn't matter. Because as a thesis, all we're talking about is the behavior. We're not talking about how it's generated. And we're talking about a conceptual claim, which is any rational agent has to be like this. And so you come up with one counterexample that shoots down the, the overall general kind of conceptual claim. So, so I do think the nature of philosophy 
which is to investigate these sort of conceptual or necessary claims and, and, and argue back and forth for them, makes it the case that this issue of you know how you get what, what are the means to those ends and are those means different from ours? That ends up not being that not, doesn't really matter. That essentially many many neural networks like cyclotrons and other other systems rely on on modeling the modeling the three D plane, a very a very dynamic structure. Do you think that they they will ever reach a limit? Do you believe that you believe that they will reach a certain limit to the the capabilities of artificial intelligence or perhaps? Yeah, there's tons of computational limits right now. So, for example, um, I can't give you a machine learning algorithm that can crack the Bitcoin encryption, right? I can't do that. Why can't I do that? I can tell you straight up that I can't do it. It's not that I tried. I didn't go do any research on that, right? I can just tell you right now that I can't do it. Why not? Because we can't crack that encryption with the computers that we have right now. It doesn't matter how great the algorithms are that you train on them. The computers don't have the, the capacity to do that yet. Well, we just hit quantum supremacy last month, right? Or maybe it was a month before. It depends on whether you believe Google or IBM. But uh, we hit quantum supremacy sometime around right now. And what does that mean? Well, that means that a quantum computer can do something that no classical computer can do. What do you mean by that? Well, the, the, the paper that Google published on this is this pretty straightforward um, procedure. And I think they did it in 300 seconds. and. Uh, the best guess for the fastest classical computer on Earth would be 10,000 years. So it did something in a couple, a couple hundred seconds that the best classical or best you know, standard computer would take 10,000 years to do. Well, that's pretty impressive. Now, here's the question. Can quantum computers do anything? And we already know the answer is no, right? Or at least we think the answer is no. And so one big question in future years for machine learning and for these sorts of philosophical applications are gonna be, what can quantum machine learning do that classical machine learning can't do? And are there limits there? We know there's limits in the classical case. What are the limits in the quantum case? Right now, we don't know. And anybody who tells you they know what the limits are is lying to you. Because we simply don't have enough information about how quantum information theory is supposed to go to be able to answer these questions when you get into something like, you know, a million qubits or something like that. Just that. So I think the answer to your question is, yeah, there's limits. We don't know exactly what they all are going to be. Yeah. Yeah. So, very nice. I've been thinking about machines publishing papers. I have a sort of information theoretic question. Great, right, yeah. So, in the examples you gave, yeah. there's a big corpus that already exists and has been generated, and things are being intelligently distilled out of it in a way that we could have done 10 years earlier and didn't. Is, there must be some measure of the information embedded in that corpus. Yeah. I'm wondering whether the repeat process of dragging out a new thesis and dragging out a new argument generates information and you know whether it does so fast enough that this community of artificial philosophers could be self-sustained. Hmm. Okay, so if you're thinking about Shannon information theory, that's probably the most stripped down concept of uh, information that's still formal uh, and, you know, and quantitative. Right. And for the most part, Shannon information doesn't play a big role in thinking about how we throw language around. There was a really nice result that just came out a couple of months ago about the rate of Shannon information that comes out when people speak in different languages. Right, Because if I speak one language, I might speak faster. Uh, in another language, I might speak slower, but there's more word or whatever. And it turns out there's a pretty, a pretty standard rate of information across language usage. That's a nice result, right? But for the most part, this notion of information doesn't play a big role in thinking about the nature of language or in thinking about how uh, 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 disciplines uh, develop over time. Okay? But there's more sophisticated, I don't want to say this, yeah, there's like more um, substantive notions of information. Uh, so if you think about something like um, 
uh, uh, notions of information that have to do with whether it's something is true or false, like representing the world, those kinds of notions of information might play a bit more of a role in these kinds of things. But the problem is they're not that easy to, to quantify. And so I don't get nice, neat you know, results like, um, but like what you get in Shannon information theory from these things. So it's kind of hard to answer your question a little bit. If I just go with Shannon, I have very little in the way of application to, to, to guide my answer here. If I go with these other ones, I have very little in the way of you know, quantitative theory at all. So I do think, though, that if we just take it at a sort of intuitive level, and we think about what humans have, what information humans have, and what this algorithm would be presenting, then it would be giving you new information in a sort of intuitive sense. It would not just be giving you new information, it would also be giving you new information about that information as new arguments or novel arguments for it. Now, it depends on how you think about deduction, but you can think about deduction in information theoretic terms as well. And so that's nice. And uh, there's a nice theory there that's, uh, that was kind of pioneered in the 1990s. And you can use that to think about how much information is in an argument. And my guess is that the answer to your question would be yes. This, there would be enough here, it would be substantive enough that you could ultimately have, in principle, uh, a community of artificial philosophers purely working off of each other. Uh, I, I don't see any reason to think that, just based on the way the algorithms work, that that couldn't happen. Now, again though, I'm not basing this on anything having to do with information theory, per se, because I don't think that you can really use information theory to answer this question in the way that we understand it right now. I don't know if that helps. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you. Um, and so for philosophical AI and with moving through examples and counterexamples, do you see the practice of philosophy becoming more like scientific research? Yeah, I do. If so, then is this generally a good thing? Yeah, it is. Uh, <laughs> I do see it becoming, I do see it as one step in trying to make philosophy more scientifically minded. Um, and I do think that that's a good thing. One of, the, one of the things that I've argued for in my own work is uh, a, a, a position um, uh, that is in the sort of methodological naturalist camp. Those two, when you, people use naturalism in philosophy, you have to be really careful because people mean really different things. Most people mean reductive naturalism, which is something like, I can, I can take anything that anybody does and reduce that to the sciences. And that, I think, is false. That, I think, is just wrong. You can't reduce ethics to the sciences. You can't reduce you know, law, legal uh, kinds of considerations to the sciences. Those things are, are, are inherently not reductive. But instead, the kind of naturalism I'm talking about is a sort of continuity in tools between philosophy and the sciences. And there, I think that there's a lot to be said for utilizing the tools of the sciences, formal frameworks, careful uh, uh, ways of formulating different reasonings and different positions, usually using the tools of the sciences, and I mean, my, my favorite kind of hobby work on this is measurement theory, right? I think measurement theory should be much more utilized within philosophy, but um, that's a talk for a different night. Um, but so the, the idea here would be if there's a continuity in tools between the sciences and philosophy, the subject matters don't have to be the same. And it doesn't have to be that philosophical things like what's good or what's right are reducible to scientific questions. I don't think they are. But it might very well be that the same sorts of tools allow us to progress on answering those questions that are also utilized and help us progress on answering questions in the, the sciences as well. So I do think it does have this as a side effect. I'm not aiming for this. This is like something that I'm trying to accomplish by pushing this, this stuff. But I do think as a side effect, it does have this, this sort of consequence of bringing philosophy and the sciences, at least methodologically, together. Um, since you did ask one already, I'm going to, if anyone else wants to. Um, yeah, you used the word objective <clears throat> when you were describing the categories created by the machine learning yeah. algorithm for. Uh, yeah. uh, it's a mistake. But yeah, I was, trying to, I was trying to kind of contrast it with what you come up with just sitting around thinking about it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is that what you're asking? 
What do I mean by that? Yeah, I, well, I was going to ask what rule can be used to test whether conclusions and categories created by machine learning could be described as objective or... No. So th this is the biggest problem with uh, with unsupervised machine learning. I, 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 I've tried to refer to this like eight times now. I've, I've read the product, but um, if you look back at the categories, um, the supervised is pretty straightforward. We have lots of good ways of deciding whether an, uh, a, a supervised algorithm is giving you objectively good answers. Right? Unsupervised, for the most part. One of the biggest problems, and it's a standard problem in literature, is how do you judge whether an unsupervised program is actually doing a good job? And for the most part, you're kind of comparing it with your own intuitions when you think about the, those topics, right? And you can compare it to other supervised learning algorithms, right? You're like, well, this one came up with more interesting categories than this one, right? This one came up with categories that, when I think about them, I, move, I get further, they seem more fruitful. But in terms of like an objective measure, this one's right, this one's wrong, you're not gonna get that. And so when I say objective, what I mean is something like sensitive to the patterns of data that are really there, as opposed to a person sitting in a chair and just making stuff up. Yeah, so there's a big question here, you know, what is it like to be an algorithm? <laughs> um, some people think there's nothing it's like to be an algorithm. Some people think, well, you're running on algorithms and there's something it's like to be you, so uh, presumably there is something it's like to be an algorithm, or at least a constellation of algorithms. Uh, I think that probably as the machine learning advances and get more and more interaction with philosophy, these kinds of questions are going to have to be rethought. And already you see in the literature worries about the concept of experience and how important the concept of experience is in understanding philosophical topics, where experience is understood as something inherently you know, internal, inherently you know, subjective, inherently you know, what it's like to be me. Um, there is, I'm sure you know, a big, dis a big dispute in philosophy of mind about whether uh, zombies are conceivable, and if they are, does that mean that they're possible? Where a zombie doesn't mean like something on The Walking Dead, instead it means something like, just like a human being behaves just like a human being, but there's nothing it's like to be it. Right? So a, zo a philosophical zombie isn't distinguishable from a human being from the outside. It's distinguishable only from the inside. And so now the question would be, here's one option. Humans are not zombies in this sense, but algorithms are. And so the, and that, if that's right, then they'll never be able to do what we can do in the sense of be the kind of thing for which it, you know, there's something it's like to be. They, they can never generate experience in the way that humans have experience, if that's the case. My guess, though, is that that's not what's going to Instead, what we'll find is that this idea that there's this thing, experience, which you have access to and nobody else does, and it's all internal and, and subjective and inherently that way, there just isn't anything like that. And, uh, and ultimately, the, the, there'll be a sort of convergence of the things that you can do and the things that those things can do. Because when we look at your brain, we know at a certain level of description, your brain's just implementing some of these algorithms, right? Maybe the training's different, you know, maybe it's vastly more complicated than what we can you know, deal with right now, but um, ultimately it's the same sort of thing. So it would be really surprising if you are powered by algorithms, but somehow you're qualitatively different than just anything else that's powered by algorithms. That would be surprising. But this is a great, I mean, I think this is gonna be a growth 
a growth area thinking about these kinds of questions, you know, what is it like to be an algorithm type questions? Yeah. All right, uh, last question. Um, <coughs> where do you think the results of generative algorithms will be able to like consistently pass Turing tests? So generative ones are ones that um, produce text or images or whatever. If you if you listened to the Joe Rogan deep fakes that came out uh, maybe like four or five months ago, uh, those are gen those are created by a generative algorithm. And you'll see coming up. I mean, there's already bits of you know videos that are obviously fake, um, but they look really interestingly fake, right? There's like um, there's one where it's like some guy's face turns into Donald Schwarzenegger for a while, and he's interpreter impersonating him. Um, there's some other kind of ones like that. Those are all run off of generative algorithms. And the generative ones are the ones that are like creative in this way. Okay, so um, the question, though, about the Turing test, I don't think um, you'll have to... I, it's not obvious to me that a generative one would be the one that would pass the Turing test. I would expect maybe a reinforcement learner would be the first one to really pass a Turing test. But the problem with this, though, is nobody means the same thing by a Turing test. And so the, what the test that Turing originally had was like, you're in a room and you get, you know, electronic answers from this thing, and you try to decide whether it's a person or not. And you, you can already f fool a lot of people with that, right? I mean, there's like whole subreddits dedicated to people who get tricked by chatbots, right? So, I mean, there's already that. Uh, so you gotta mean, we presumably mean something stronger than that. And then it's not exactly clear what the Turing test is supposed to be, or what it's testing. Or, so I don't know the answer to this. I, I think that what you'll find is that eventually we will have things that humans cannot distinguish in any way at all from another human being interacting with them. Um, and uh, I think that should count as passing the Turing test. But it's not clear to me the generative ones are gonna be the ones that do that. Maybe there'll be generative algorithms in there, but my guess is you'd have to have a whole constellation of different machine learning algorithms all interacting and getting feedback in different ways as a team to, to, to model some kind of complicated agent that would be possible, or that would be capable of passing a Turing test. I hope that makes sense. All right, uh, one final round of applause for Kevin. Thank you.